Well, hello and welcome to Insight with Political Tours and Beyond the Headlines. Our guest today is Asna Seerstadt, author of the best-selling bookseller of Kabul, famous for her accounts of ordinary people living in war zones across the world, from Afghanistan to the Balkans, Chechnya and Iraq. Her most recent book, published in 2018, is called Two Sisters and looks at two women brought up in Norway who leave the country for Syria ultimately to become jihadi brides. Before that, she wrote a gripping but horrific account of the July 2011 attacks on, by Anders Breivik in Norway. Asna, hello and welcome to Insight. Thank you, hello. Over the next hour, we're going to cast an eye over your many books and ask how you came to write them and also ask why you chose to write about the people you do. But before we start, can you just give us a brief idea what you're working on at the moment? Now I'm working on a book about the United States and it's the most difficult thing I've ever done. Uh, all other books are about war zones and uh, or extremists and suddenly I'm uh, in, in a country that's also, it's also difficult because so much has been written about it and I always, I kind of feel very humble, it's like, well, who am I from Scandinavia to write anything? And, and what's you? the premise, what's pushed you to, to go to the US? And I think more specifically to a southern state, a southern state. Yes, it was the election of Trump four years ago where I was thinking, hmm, the US is going to change. I, I'm going to be there with the change. So I started actually up in North Dakota. So I, I tried out different states uh, and went through and ended up down in Alabama, where I brought my family, um, two children who went to school, uh, me working at a local diner, uh, trying out all uh, positions as cook, uh, dishwasher, cleaner, waitress, uh, guest uh obviously uh so um as a little microcosm of america uh in terms of race in terms of class in terms of gender mm -hmm. uh, so you're really trying to immerse yourself in that society to try and get a better understanding of it Let, let's come back to that in a bit i'm fascinated to ask you lots of questions about that we've just been we've been following the u.s elections quite closely and done an in-depth series looking at six counties across the states mm -hmm. and the last session we just had was looking at trump 73 million why did so many people uh, vote for donald trump so that's a, a question that's been on our minds mm -hmm. but let's get back to your books, um, the books that you've published um, so far. Um, but let's just ask, how did you actually get started? Because I know when you first were reporting, you were a broadcast journalist back in Kosovo. Yes, well, I started out um, in, uh, even before that, at 23, uh, I was a Moscow correspondent. I really got thrown into this business of writing and and, uh, uh, and being a journalist and I work for a little Norwegian daily in Moscow and already then immersing myself with people because back then out of necessity because I didn't have money this was a little paper I was uh, I was kind of a freelance correspondent uh, so I lived with a Russian family with four children uh, I had a little room uh, I had a little, in the beginning, just a typewriter <laughs> and then afterwards a computer. Uh, and in order to, to be able to afford being a foreign correspondent, I also worked as a translator for British journalists or Canadian journalists or for French journalists. Mm -hmm. So uh, that, uh, and they taught me, you know, how to be a journalist. So, so it was, uh, it was in like, almost like in between being a student and a, and a journalist, that's how I got to my first war, Chechnya. And then later when I started in, uh, in TV, uh, I wasn't yet at the foreign desk, but I remember the foreign editor looked at me when Kosovo came up and said, you've been to a war before, so we'll send you. Uh, so that's how my kind of uh, war correspondent career in TV started. Right. 
but you you put some after some time you put that aside your first book was about serbia um it was written in norwegian it was um there was profiles of various people i think you were really trying to give people a better understanding of serbian society but it's really the bookseller of kabul that really brings you your um, global attention fame if you like can you tell us how you came upon that story Yes, so I, after September 11th, I left the Balkans. Uh, this that very day I understood that uh, that story is over and there's a new story opening up. Uh, and this, this sounds very cynical right now, but it was more like, if you remember those days, like, uh, is the Third World War happening? What's going to happen? So I went back to Oslo, back to my TV station, and I, you know, signed up for service. And they said, we need you at the desk. And I was like, at the desk. <laughs> and then I just went on my own uh, and uh, crept across the border from uh, Tajikistan to Afghanistan and uh, hang out with the Northern Alliance and follow them down to Kabul, working for a Norwegian newspaper. Got into Kabul with, uh, with them on the day that Kabul fell. And one of the first days there in November, 2011, uh, 2001, I'm sorry. Um, I came upon this little book sign on a, on a shop saying books or bookshop. Uh, and I was thinking, wow, uh, that's, you know, let, you know, go in and look. And, and in that darkness of the place, because there was no electricity at the time, I saw this old man who was rearranging books and then he told me a story that this was his shop and and everything he'd gone through at the time of the Taliban in terms of censorship and in terms of you know what was allowed to sell and not and I found him so fascinating so I wrote a piece about him in for my newspaper and went several times back to see him and one day he invites me for dinner uh, and up to then all the afternoon dinner I'd I've been to have been in the countryside where men and women eat separately uh, and everything is very uh, standoffish in a way. Mm. So I come to his family and this is the first time I see men and women eating together. They all sit on the floor eating from uh, the same pots as him, his two wives, his you know children, several children, his mother, cousin. So it's like, it's so lively and quite fun and I'm thinking this family is a book uh, and I was thinking because he was quite famous among the correspondents so I was thinking probably everyone had that, had that idea so I, I had to like quickly nail it mm -hmm. before someone else took it and uh, that's how I felt about it uh, even when I mentioned it to my fellow journalists, they were like, oh yeah, a book about him? Mm, all right, well. So uh, it seems no one would actually, you know, ha have the same idea. So that's how it started. And so the next day I went to see him in his bookshop and I asked him to sit down uh, if we could, uh, you know, have a serious conversation. Uh, I brought up my book on Serbia to show him I'm a real writer. I'm not just, you know, a wannabe writer. I've written a book before. I want to come and write about your family because I have realized that, you know, the pillar of the African society are the family and the clan. And, uh, and then he just said, welcome. And then I moved in. Mm. It's about male patriarchy, um, the role of women, in what might be called a sort of middle class, sort of urban Afghanistan. Um, but in staying with the family, you get access to things that no, no neighbor normally would. You get access to their conversations, the marital relationships, you know, views about sex. And a lot of it's you know, quite shocking in some ways. How, did, how are they so open with you? Uh... Some people were open, uh, some were not. Uh, so those who are the main characters in the book are those who wanted to share. Uh, as you see, the bookseller's two wives are not very present in the book because they, you know, they didn't really share much, but his sister is, his, one of his sons is. Uh, and um, they... Um, I mean, it's like, even though you say it's very private, it's, I mean, I don't know, it's not that 
intimate maybe i don't know it's um it's uh i mean the sister not, 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 the young not, sister was very frustrated not, with her life so she wanted to question another way there, mm -hmm. there are, what are the things that um challenged i mean i'm just trying to think of the things that that um might surprise people i mean i'm just i'm thinking about the young um one of the, the boys their views about sex and how it might mm. be easy to obtain sex by mm. getting a homeless woman into the mm. bookshop the, the yeah. animals like that that really are quite shocking yeah. Mm. yeah that's true but but that is an anonymous person so he's telling about even though one might guess that he's part of it and <laughs> this is now 20 years ago but mm. in the book he is just he hears this story about you know the the colleague in the shop across the street who uh you know all these homeless children who are uh you know survive on child prostitution uh going from you know shopkeeper to shopkeeper uh so it's uh, he told me those stories uh and even showed me the girls and you know that's the one uh and i saw it from you know from outside uh, so it's like, I think it's just important to, to mm. focus on how terrible uh, uh, some people lived in Afghanistan and still live. Because remember, this was a time of hope. After all, 2002, when I was there and did most of the work of the book, uh, was the most peaceful time in Afghanistan ever. Uh, the Taliban was still resting and, and uh, apparently the uh yeah uh, the the winner somehow of, of that war had control for a little year uh so this was a time where we thought that uh, or people thought that it would be better uh mm -hmm. at least better than during the taliban so it was important to focus on those things that you know we might help uh help with if not rooting out but to yeah. just show one of the elements that really stands out is the the arrival of the second wife in the story and the turmoil that um that that causes within the family the opposition there is within the the family from the first wife which is perhaps you'd expect it but also from the new young bride who really has got no choice in this of course mm. oh yes that is uh it's a story of um patriarchy uh, definitely uh, and uh, men's power so uh, when he gets tired of the first wife uh, he then I use the word I don't say that he bought her uh, but I do you know there's always a price involved so that was actually has been an issue between us afterwards whether he bought her or not but that is how you you know I mean, he's a rich man and he uh, marries this very poor relative who's 16 year old. The father is paralyzed, uh, um, very poor family. And, and um, with the money they get for her, uh, they can have get education for their sons um, and buy a new house uh, so, um, or mend their house. So it's uh, uh, it's um, it's a man's world, uh, and of course the the first wife couldn't do anything. Yes, she could scream and she could be against it, but but she couldn't. It's his right. Uh, as long as he treats them uh, mm -hmm. equally, uh, he's allowed to have up to four wives. And there's a fateful moment when the second wife is told by one of her uncles, "This is who you're being." going to be given away to you, um, you have one moment to say anything about it and you need to say it now because this is the only time you'll ever have any word about it. And it's a quite a, a shocking moment. Let's just bring up um, the, the, the book covers there, if we can bring those up now, Isabel, just so we can have a look at it. So um, the, here's the, the bookseller of, of Kabul, which is, I, sold, I think it sold half a million copies, is that right, Asna? I think it sold like three million copies. Three million, wow. Yeah. Half a million is in the UK, I think. In the UK, right. Yeah. Um, or, um, yeah. I want to fast forward um, to 2015, and this is one of us, which is the one I mentioned earlier about Anders Breivik and the uh, 22nd of July um, killings in, in, in Norway. Um, and then um, the mo most recent one, which is produced in 2018, uh, is The Two Sisters. Um, and... It, it's there's a link in a way between these these two stories. I mean, obviously Norway is the the, the connection. Um, 
but I'm, I'm interested in the way you managed to put together um, your reporting on the stories. Um, with Anders Breivik, it's obvious that you've got a wealth of material. There's a trial that takes place over a long period of time. Um, there are documents that the police have, there are psychologists' reports. So that gives you a wealth of evidence to immerse yourself in, to really produce a very um, a forensic analysis of, of um, his upbringing, but also the stories of the people who were ultimately you know, killed um, on, the, on that fateful day. So that, that's where that comes from. But tell me how you managed to put together the story about the two sisters, the Somali family living in Norway, uh, and these two young women who then decide to leave for Syria. How did you come across that story? And then how did you manage to put that together? How did you come across the story to start with? Well, that's the first book that wasn't my idea. Uh, it was my publisher's idea. Uh, so it happened that my publisher knew someone who knew uh, Sadiq, who's the father in the family. Uh, and he was desperate to get attention to the story because he wanted to save his daughters, uh, get them out of Syria. This was uh, like, uh, yeah, less than a year after they left. So uh, seven months after they left that, uh, that I met, that, that, that uh, my publisher met him. And then she asked me if I wanted to write it. And I was... First, I was uncertain uh, to do it. Uh, one reason I was working on a book on Libya <laughs> that I never finished because of all the violence that started there in 2014 when I started this book. Uh, but also I was like, ah, oh, I was thinking this is gonna be a mess. You know, a family, another family, just like the bookstore of Kabul, uh, a family who are looking for their daughters. I was thinking, you know, we don't have the same interest. I was just certain that they would want to cover up things or, uh, so I was, yeah, reluctant. And then after a week, I, I was thinking after all, you know, this is so interesting. Like, uh, this was the peak. It was not yet the peak because the peak was 2015 when, when the, most, the biggest amount of uh, Europeans, uh, young European teenagers, 20 somethings, went to Syria to fight or yeah, to live. Uh, so I decided to meet the, the father, um, like uh, a bit reluctantly. I remember I, I dressed up like almost like a lawyer and I was very strict. Uh, with him like first finding out if he wanted to write his own book and he didn't and then I said okay fine but then it's my book because it's like as a journalist you can't really cooperate with you have to have a distance from the story uh, so um, that is how it we had it got a contract that I would write the book then uh, and what I thought at the time was what he told me then was that the girls were desperate to leave Serbia. That was what I got into. Leave, leave Syria? Leave, yeah. Mm. So that was his version, uh, which turned out not to be true. Uh, but I was thinking, okay, so we had to, I was, I got this very, you know, uh, got this great speed because uh, I was thinking they're soon gonna be here. So I'll do all the research. Slightly. So they, they've left Norway, they've gone yeah. to Syria, they've moved mm -hmm. across into ISIS territory. Mm -hmm. And here's the father, Sadiq, who's trying to get his daughters back. Yeah. And th that's the story you're telling. And, and there's a point at which he realizes, and obviously you realize sometime uh, as well, that they're not having it. In actual fact, um, they're extremely happy with their position within yeah. ISIS. He probably knew all the, all, uh, it's a bit of delusion for him. So he probably knew that all the way, but, but for, he just wanted it to be true because what a betrayal. 16 and 19 at the time when they left, just age 16 and 19. Yeah. So for him as a father, and he's very open about that. Uh, he felt he's, you know, he failed as a father. He failed as a patriarch. He failed as a husband. He failed as a... Uh, as someone who should take care of his family. Uh, so it was easier for him to say that they were kidnapped and that they were desperate to come back to him than to acknowledge that, you know, they didn't bother to see him again or even speak to him. 
He goes to Syria, he tries to get them back, he gets arrested and um, put in prison in terrible conditions um, uh, uh, in, in any attempt to do so. Um, and you report some truly appalling things, including the executions. But one of the things that really stands out is the, the girls' reactions to the circumstances they're in. How, do you, how did you manage to piece together their views? How did you get their comments on it? I never spoke with them. So that is, uh, so then people can start to worry. So how do you then know? Uh, so then it's like, uh, it was almost like writing about someone who's dead. Like when you write a biography about someone who has lived, but who's not there. So I started out thinking that I would get their stories once they got back to Norway, which they never did. So I had to uh, get the information through other sources. Uh, and the greatest source was their brother, who was in between them in age and had gone to the same Quran teacher, had gone through the same you know, school system and later on to meeting the people that radicalized his sisters. But he was the one who first started to feel a bit uneasy about you know the fundamentalist view of islam and then later he um became you know um um against against their influence but but he still he hadn't figured out what had happened happening so he felt guilty not seeing having seen that they'd left so he it's kept on communicating that with them for two and a half, three years. And, and that's because, gave them, because you've got access to their conversations. That, that log where they speak not to me, but to him, which make them uh, more open. Um, and it seems to me, because many have asked you, would they have been under ISIS censorship? And it's, I think maybe the ISIS censorship is a bit, bit exaggerated when it comes to their family conversations, because if they felt they had been, um, uh, you know, that someone were looking through their logs, their chats, there were many things they wouldn't have written. Uh, so I think they were actually quite free, uh, but of course, trying to convince him, and it's through reading these logs that I realized they just never wanted to come back. What the father told me was not true. Uh, so uh, it's um, the book took so many terms, ter uh, turns. Just give us uh, some idea, some of the, the some of their comments. So I mean, I'm thinking about what happened to the, the she. One of the girls is living in a house. She says she's been given it for free. What are her attitudes about being given it? And also the, her Syrian neighbors, or the neighbors who are Syrian who lived next door, are taken away. Can you mm -hmm. just? Give us an account of some of the, the comments that, that she makes during these internet chats. Yes, it's amazing. I, many of these girls, and they're actually quite similar because I also read logs from other girls or from Britain or Australia or uh, the US. They're very entitled. They feel very entitled to everything they got or came across their houses and they're bragging about houses that have everything like vacuum cleaner and you know filled up cupboards and and obviously they took the best houses and the european or foreign jihadis came with money so they're the one who ruled raqqa or so the new like the wives would get you know the the european wives would get the uh, or Western wives would get the, the best houses and, and have for a while, because they sent pictures to their mother. Uh, and I saw the pictures and you could see, you know, not tall, like the whole living room, but you could see, you know, the, you know, when they got babies, like, you know, perfectly new baby clothes, you know, not a spot, spotless. Uh, you saw what kind of, you know, food, drinks, um, they were living for a year or two, like real in a bubble where everything was shipped uh, to them uh, from Turkey. And these two girls too, they came with money because in, a, in the very gullible Norwegian state gave them like student loans and starting loans and, and they had like several credit cards. So they went, you know, with several thousand dollars to the war zone. There's a quote from the father when he's uh, imprisoned and there are um, some Syrian farmers who are taken away to be executed. Um, you know, we, one doesn't know why. Um, and one of the farmers simply says, what kind of hell is this? 
Um, and that that's a sort of really shocking, shocking um, sort of insight into things there. Uh, did, did you get, do you think you had an understanding of their motivations? And I think one of the other things really interesting is that you've had contact with the two sisters. I mean, they, they have now, since the book has been published, mm -hmm. um, it appears that they've actually read it. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I haven't spoken to them. Uh, I wanted to speak to them. I actually went down to see them because they survived the war and they were set, put in al Hol camp in Syria. So I went down there. To meet them uh, and they wanted to read the book first so through the uh, one of the humanitarian organizations in the camp uh, we sent them the book and then they didn't want to meet me after all but they had read the book and I was thinking I was probably maybe I was naive in thinking they would want to see me because I thought that they've been living then for five years in Syria and they probably saw all of Europeans as, you know, someone who see them as terrorists or, uh, you know, totally brainwashed. And I would say that I've actually written about them in a way uh, that I was actually kind of proud is probably the wrong word, but, but, but when you write about someone you can't speak to, I have like, I felt that when I finished the book, this was a book that I could pick up, give to them and say, hey, uh, you left for Syria. I wanted to find out why. Uh, this is what I found out. Please read. You know, uh, they could be, they could, you know, be against or not, but I wouldn't think that they would, you know, I would, I thought they, they would be positively uh, surprised because I actually do all support them as a, and intelligent beings as uh, people who actually also use logic and uh, and and uh, because it was no point for me to try to write about I mean my goal in this writing about the radicalization was to try to find out why you know so um so but but then they read it and they were furious and they hated it so uh, and that's all I know so there was a Norwegian journalist who just spoke to them uh, last week so that's the first time we hear about them from them after reading the book so uh, what they say they just say that um, she doesn't have the right she didn't have the right to do this what's her right to to get into our lives we never wanted to be famous and we have the right to a private life. That's everything they say. They don't say anything is wrong or anything like that, but that they just said she has no right. That's quite something, isn't it? That's quite a, yeah. quite a statement. Yeah. Um, please do, everyone listening in, um, start putting your questions in the Q&A box here. Um, Asna has covered a whole range of different um, areas, you know, the conflicts in, you know, going back in Chechnya, um, uh, we're talking about Iraq, Afghanistan, um, I met Lasna in Libya, so she's been there too. Um, we can also talk about the US and what she's doing there. So there's plenty, plenty to discuss here. Um, so please do put your questions in the Q&A box as, as we continue. Asna, you were sued by the um, Afghan family. Um, can you tell us a bit about that? What was their complaint against you? Uh, let me think, because it, it lasted for 13 years. So it's like Court what was the complaint? Thirteen years. So from two thousand three to it was settled in two thousand fifteen. But then it carried. Then he wanted to. So that's twelve years when it was settled. But then he carried on. When you say settled, what does that mean? A decision oh, was made, or do you made a payment? I won. I won in the Supreme Court. Okay, okay so. So that's why it's even hard to, I mean, of course, uh, juridically, it was breach of privacy. Mm. Uh, but so what, at the very basic um, level, it's you came into their house mm. and uh, there was a breach of trust, essentially, if that's the saying, mm. you did not have the right to write what you did. Is that that's essentially it, and bre breach their privacy? The same complaint as the as the yeah, that's the complaint. But but remember, I don't speak the Afghan language. Uh, I don't. I couldn't listen to like 
secret conversations whispered and then write them everything that i wrote was translated to me through a translator or through members why, of the family. why did you change their names why did you change because you wrote it as as fiction almost i mean it was it was a a factually based account but it was written like fiction as though it was a novel mm. yeah it's written like a novel so I changed their names. Uh, maybe that is a bit like, uh, you know, so, uh, subconsciously, maybe I knew that they would be, that they wouldn't like it or that some of them wouldn't like it. it I mean, it's not, it's just, I mean, it's basically the, the bookseller who's, who's complained, not the other family members. Uh, so I changed their names somehow in order to, you know, Yes, of course, everyone in the family would know who they were and people who knew them, but they would be able to go, go out in the street and say, no, that's not me. Mm. Uh, if I'd used their real names, they couldn't, be, they couldn't have said that. So um, I think for the bookseller, um, and of course, I'm probably to blame in order to, to not understand his expectations, like he expected, and I wasn't realizing that it, he has expected that this would be a hagiography of him saving the books which it is too i mean he's a great per person but he's also a patriarch and he's he's not a worse patriarch than any he's like a middle of the road patriarch mm. but that's bad enough for for a you know british reader who thinks but that's really unfair why doesn't he let her study why doesn't why does why does he close the you know the, the the fresh fruit away why does he why is he the only one to be able to eat fresh fruit when the daughters has to eat when it's too old or too you know too rotten for him so it's like okay as a journalist should i be like oh that is so embarrassing to him how can i write about how he closes you know how he keeps the best food in to himself is like yes uh, so he didn't expect me to write that of course because nothing has ever gone against him in his life he's a bulldozer so he's like you know he's trading and he's rich and he's uh yes the taliban went against him um but it's like he i realized afterwards he just didn't expect there to be anything negative. Mm. I, I'm really interested in, in this bit here because I think as a journalist and I think novelists um, undergo the same challenge as well and in that you have to, um, you, in a way you're taking people's lives around you whether it's their secrets or you know things you're actually seeing and then you're writing about them, you're publishing them um, and there's a sensitivity there to an extent that you have to trample upon. Um, I'm, I imagine, you know, you're writing about the people in Alabama and um, will you go, will you name them? Um, is it something that you'd, uh, are, are they going to be entirely happy about? I mean, it's, it's a sort of dilemma that you're having to weigh up all the time, isn't it? Mm. Oh yeah, I will use, um, I mean, it's a different time. It's like uh, 2001, 2002, when the book was written. Uh, it's, now with the internet, it's like when I, in Alabama, I'm so working at the diner, I'm like, I'm here to write a book. Nobody thinks I'm there to, I'm not an undercover. I mean, I, I would have, I would have loved to be one, but it's very different. I mean, I could have, but then I would have had to go somewhere else. Uh, because a white woman, my age and uh, mm, I would never have worked, worked in that diner. It would, I mean, then I would have had to go up north. Mm. You know, I could have worked in that diner uh, because there you have the white working class, but in Alabama, no. So um, yeah, so, so that's, no, so, so I will, I mean, after the bookseller of Kabul, I've let all my, uh, except from the two sisters though, the two girls, everyone reads through everything. Like, because I can have, I mean, I had that one trial. I can't have two because you can get away or not up to the reader to judge, but you can maybe get away with one trial. It's like, okay, that's what she thought. That's what he thought. He wasn't pleased with the book. He wasn't pleased with how he, uh, 
he was presented maybe you know this and that but i can't have two so after that of course that has changed my reporting because after the books on kabul i have to be like so certain uh, that people not that they were pleased with their portrait but that they had approved their uh quotes or so mm -hmm. in two sisters uh and in one of us uh like everyone even the anonymous sources they read through both to see am i still anonymous uh like their portrait or just to see if it's certain the mother re read through her or got it she's uh illiterate but she got it read to her through an you know official translator the father read it. So, um, uh, yeah, so the, I will do the same in Alabama, like the, everyone, do you, do unfortunately, they have to read through. Do you, so feel, the process. do you feel compromised is that? I mean, as a, if, when I was a reporter, I would never if, um, show my um, final report to people I'd interview. I'd say, okay. right, you agreed to the interview, I did the interview, and, and that's that. I'm not seeking your approval for what I publish. Yeah. Yeah, I and mean, in in journalism, that's you know, of course, the right thing to do. Um, but in a book, I'm not sure because I spend so much time with these people. Um, but I don't need to give them. I mean, I I mean, I gave them the whole book to read. I didn't like. Of course, you can pick out the quotes, and and then you can decide, you know, how you wrap it in. Um, but I just let them read everything. Okay. So and the, the girlfriends, they read their chapters. Of yeah. course, they're not going to read the chapters of others. They only got to read their things. I, I don't want to steal your um, the story for your next book from you. Um, but can you say a bit more about what, what are you looking for in Alabama? What are the stories you're looking for? What are you hoping to find? What are you finding? Well, I am, um, I am, the, the questions have, have uh, changed also a, a little bit. Of course, uh, when Trump won, uh, all of us um, who were not Trumpists <laughs> were trying to find out where does he come from and what is it? And very quickly, uh, people realized he's, you know, he's a sim symptom on, uh, of something. He, he's not, he hasn't changed really anything. And then, so the more I stay there, the further back I feel I need to go. Uh, and of course, you can go as far back as you want to, but I've started the story in the 60s, uh, where the first, like, cultural war <laughs> started. Uh, and I follow then from the 60s, one family that are conservative, evangelical, white people, and one family that are more uh, with a, you know, more like black protest background. And, and these, these two families, that, and then there's, of course, in the end here, there's a love story. And um, the difficulties in Alabama being a black, white couple um which is uh very very there are very few of so it's um that is and that is a bit like when you go to alabama it's impossible not to write about race so it's been less about like what made trump like he suddenly like faded away and i'm kind of actually happy for that now because uh who wants to read about trump now from me you know it's it's so it's like that's how it started out but then suddenly these other stories of Alabama just like took the front seat. And then uh, it's, it's, and then in the middle of all this, I'm on the diner and I brought my kids uh, and uh, family and uh, yeah. Yeah, no, it, it seems to me um, in the, the, we devoted a program to it, the fact that he got so many votes, the fact that he's able to increase yeah. his really yeah. showed a significant shift in US society and uh, we've dismissed it. We've been dismissing it over the last four years, quite blithely. I want to bring in some questions now because we've got people mm. here who are, are keen to ask, um, uh, put a few questions to you. Sheila de Belague, um is in London. Go ahead, Sheila. Oh, hello. That, that's really interesting to hear you talking about your books. And I was just wondering, um, were you allowing the people you described to read the text? before they were published? And if so, did you make 
changes to your text as a result of their comments? Uh, actually, very, very few uh, changes. Uh, were you thinking of a book in particular or in general? Well, in general, that you, you in general. To books to the people to yeah, read. Yeah, in the two mm -hmm. last books. Uh, because I also written in between a book about Iraq uh, during the war. It's like there, I don't go back to, you know, a shack in, in Baghdad and, and with a manuscript in Norwegian like two years after. But in the two last books, um, the thing is like, I think the most important thing is that people know that they are able to change if they have to. So that is the good thing about having that promise even written down in a contract, uh, that they are able to change anything and even withdraw from the whole book. They and can, that's something I had- can, They can change anything and they can withdraw yeah, from the whole yeah. book. Yeah, and that's something I had to do, especially with uh, one of us, because there was so much pain and so, you know, parents who lost their children. It's like, you just like, they have to be, know, they have to know that. So you know, don't, don't you feel compromised by that? Don't you feel that your reporting has been compromised because of that? Well, it's like, it's like they, um, they are then more open. And, in the, and the, uh, in the end, they didn't change anything. The only thing they changed was like, no, you know, it didn't happen in fifth grade. It happened in sixth grade. Uh, and that's, it wasn't the uncle, I mean, you misunderstood here, this was his cousin. Mm. That was the kind of things they changed. Uh, I remember Sadiq, the father, um, there was one thing he wanted to change. Uh, and that was because he had actually been, <laughs> he had fooled the Norwegian authorities, he had fooled the embassy, you know, he got out like, you know, hundreds of thousands of Norwegian kroners in, in help. Uh, on, a, on an illusion because the girls, he didn't even know where the girls were. So he fooled everyone. He was such a clever, um, you know, uh, man in that aspect. He wanted me to take that, you know, part of that out. And I said, you know, no, I can't because it happened and uh, I know it happened and that's my research. So he's like, I, I'm, I'm not taking out things that he, you know, doesn't like. But he, but I'm changing, like I could, I, you know, I basically only change mistakes. Mm -hmm. But also if they feel, feel like, you know, that phrase, it's so, I don't mean it any longer. It feels so unfair. I would like, okay, so let's take it out because I don't want the conflict in the media afterwards. Okay. But, but, it's, it, but honestly, it hasn't really happened uh, in those two books. Mm -hmm. Like, um, it's, I, I would say when people, I remember like one thing, like when I did the chapter on the friends of the two sisters, the, the Norwegian schoolgirl friends, they read the chapter and they were like discussing, I said, you know, Osna, I think you have painted them too dark uh, because yes, we told you only the mean parts of them, but now that we read the chapter, it's like, oh, it's just like they're mean, 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 dark, dark, dark. They were also this and this and this and that. And then I was like, oh, but that's great. It makes the chapter so much better, better to have them also put in the stories of, you know, the long stretches of time when they were normal. So it's like, that's, you know, when you tell some, something about how, to, how, why, how, how did they end up in ISIS? Of course you will tell the bad stuff about them, forgetting what a chapter needs. Also the, you know, the strawberries, the picking of strawberries, the sitting uh, by, down by the water in Norway. Uh, so it's like, I would say that um, having people to read through uh, most of the time, I mean, actually always, I think it makes it better. Of course, I then, I mean, the Quran teacher uh, and the mosque uh, who didn't cooperate, they don't get to read anything. Okay. Asna, do you, um, what, what do you think should happen to the two girls now? I mean, you're careful in your reporting just to try and report things and not make any judgments, but sitting here and now, um, thinking of those two girls in Raqqa with um, their, their families or children, what do you think should happen to them now? I don't know. Uh, it's like um, they have not asked for assistance to come back to Norway. So when they don't ask for assistance, there's nothing Norway can do. 
to help them to get back, nor their children. Uh, what they want is to go to Somalia because they know that once they step on a rich and soil, they will be arrested. Uh, their children will be taken away from them, probably temporarily, maybe forever. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so and, and these are two very proud girls. So they, um, they want to live a Muslim decent life in Somalia, the life they couldn't live in Syria. But then Somalia doesn't, you know, hasn't granted them passports. And so they're still in limbo in those camps. Uh, now they're actually in two separate camps. So it's like, what do I think? I think, I mean, I don't think, should I say, should they come to Norway? Should they go to Somalia? Uh, it's not up to me to decide uh, where do they want to live their lives? Um, I understand it's tough to come back to Norway, but. Uh, for those who haven't read the book, can you just give a relay the sense of their pride? How did that? How does that come across in in their comments? Can you just tell us a bit more about that? I mean, these were really like book clever girls, uh, like bookish. They were um, at least the oldest, like you know, best in her class until she started to her decline, <laughs> where she was only interested in reading uh, religious books and the Quran and started to despise everything in Norwegian. She was like, you know, even in Norwegian language, even though she came as a six-year-old, she had, you know, best, um, uh, best results. Uh, she wanted to become a diplomat. She could have, if she hadn't, you know, uh, if that window of radicalization, if she hadn't gone through that window, she could have been the first Somali uh, diplomat or ambassador. You know, she had that potential. She wanted to work in the UN. She wanted to save the world, you know, uh, before, um, yeah. Uh, and the younger sister wanted to be a lawyer and they were always, um, that's probably why they don't like the book because then they said she has no right. Yeah. Uh, it's like they are, they want to define the world. world and, and what fascinated me about them is actually how Norwegian they had become. So when they, get on that radicalization train uh, they want to impose their values on norway because they know they have the solution they know best so they use all the tools that a western democracy can give them so they start a petition to be able to wear the full uh, niqab at school and not to gymnastics and sports and 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 you know other restrictions be able to pray five times a day whenever there's praying time in, uh, you know, whichever clock they fall out, uh, they should be able to leave the school or classroom and, and get a proper prayer room. You know, so say they, they started a petition, they wrote letters to the parliament, to the local parliament, to the city council, to the school board. Uh, they went to talk to the uh, headmaster, like, you know, these are our rights as even they, one of them even used the word feminist, like it's my feminist right to dress however I want. So it's like, they, they were just tough and they just demanded uh, and, and, and felt entitled to live however they wanted. And when they couldn't live uh, a pure Muslim life as they saw it in Norway, they le left for Syria. And I think still uh, from their, what they write and also from how they're now sitting in that refugee camp, weighing their options, ask for assistance from Norway to get back or wait for the Somali passport. They're like, they're not giving in, they're not complaining. They're just like, um, yeah, in, you know, many, many women have like, oh, I regret, uh, I, I, this is terrible, I live in hell. In that camp they haven't said anything like that there's um a quote which i think comes from the exchange with the brother um referring to the execution of an ngo worker um where he's decapitated and and uh, i think it's the elder sister describes it as awesome justice mm. um, so there's a you know in, even though in the most revolting of situations there seems to be a a pride and a, a, a sort of um, a fervent belief in the the violent system that they've joined. Um, mm -hmm. Georg Blaha has got a, a question. So, um, Georg, can you go ahead? Go on, Georg. 
Thank you, Nicholas. And um, thank you very much for the interesting um, discussion. And um, maybe just one short comment here in Germany, um, where I'm calling from. Um, we only have compromised reporting. It's very usual to submit your questions uh, and uh, the interview to the interview partner. And um, um, that just came, came on my mind in the pre previous discussion. Um, Asna, what I was wondering about, since you've um, 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 met all kinds of people from very different, with different outlooks on life and um, in our view, maybe extremist views, um, here sometimes we have um, the view that uh, there are parallels between uh, right-wing extremism and jihadi extremism. Do you also see it that way? And if so, what, what could those parallels be? Mm. I think it's a great question. As well, you yeah. stole my question from me, Georg. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, there are so many parallels. So uh, yeah, it is a very important question also because they have fed on each other too. Um, like and even directly in 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 in, uh, in those two books that are written when when Ayan uh, when she she also needs to justify her leaving Norway like morally uh, and of course to be able to do that she has to the country that she wants you know appreciated she has to make it into a terrible terrible place so when she's talking about uh, Norway later uh she she's using the example of Breivik like that's how they really are they all want to kill us they want to kill all the Muslims they're all extremists and and she would quote from things he said or other far-right people would have said and then the on the opposite you you will have the far-right or the you know extremist crowd or or Breivik who would use people like Ayan and Leila like you see, they're you're, they're ticking bombs, they're walking bombs. There, so it's like they are. Um, so, so in that very concrete way, the two are referencing mm -hmm. each other. The two are referencing each other. But isn't yeah. I think the other thing you talk about, um, particularly in the Brevik book, is this search for identity, this um, mm -hmm. loss of belonging, this sense of. Mm -hmm. It, even though that you're in a, an incredibly wealthy, you know, the wealthiest society in the world, poss possibly, this sense of um, not feeling that you belong and searching for a purpose, and in searching for a different purpose, you, you choose an extreme. Mm. Yes, and, I, and if you look at those people who join the far right and those who join the jihadi uh, crowd, even the individuals could be very similar. Like these are very often vulnerable individuals when it comes to background. So coming from social instability, often from broken families on both sides. Uh, and uh, when it comes to the jihadists in, in Germany and both in Norway, it's the same number, 60% of them were actually had some kind of you know, contact with the police, had a criminal record when you know, violent drugs, things like that. So it's like, those are the kids and that applies also for the far right. You have, you have so you see, you have, you couldn't, shouldn't say losers in that terms, Ayan and Leila, they, they kind of stand out. So it's like, it's not all of them are like that, but very often these are people who feel weak and they want to feel strong and to feel strong, you wanna, you know, you join those very powerful um, movements. They have weapons. They 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 scare people. They so it's uh, and it's also that they have the same way of looking at society as black and white. Uh, and they they don't want to live in the gray, you know, where the rest of us, the gray masses, live. But they, you know, this is the purest solution to to you know get rid of the others. So Georg, they both want to get rid of the others. Um, does that um, answer your question? Is that what you were sort of driving at, Georg? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank okay. you. I answered it to, to your question there. Um, to, 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 I mean, when do you expect to write the next book, I mean, Asna? When do you, um, I mean, it's, it's taking you four years to get, <laughs> get this material together. Yeah, for the moment, and that often happens, I feel I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not even going to finish it, I think, because it's, uh, it's, um, uh, I mean, the, as I said about the, throughout the book, I mean, writing is also thinking, like very often you, you figure out the ideas once you start writing and the direction, but I think for, just to pick up on the United States, um, 
it seems that Trump was not really a shift. It was also a continuation and of a society that is fractured and that is very group based, like you have solidarity within your group, but not really for the whole country. Uh, so I'm also doing the fact that I went there. Yeah, this is this book is going to be a change from the style of my other books because those books, uh, the other books, they're written like novels. So you, I'm not in them, but this time I'm there. So I'm also someone who's traveling and interviewing and questioning people and 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 changing throughout the, the the American journey. So that is also quite new to me um, that I have to like look the reader in the eye and, 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 and say what I think, uh, not just describe uh, others. Yeah, I, I'm intrigued about Libya. Um, that's where we met. And you your idea was to follow a school in a yeah. neighborhood in Tripoli. What happened to that book? Mm. Oh. It was shot to pieces. Uh, is that that neighborhood that I um, I followed the school, uh, girls' school uh, in in Tripoli in Abu Salim neighborhood that had used to be a very Gaddafi stronghold, but quite quickly it was taken over by the Islamists and it was run like a mafia state. And I remember one of the thing, last things that happened to me uh, was I was taken in by the military council, who is a group of thugs, and they showed me everyone they were torturing. Uh, they showed me that, you know, guys sitting there waiting for torture. And then they started to question me and asking me like, okay, so what, what are you actually doing here? Uh, they, they said, people say you are a spy. Other people were questioning, so why do you actually write about a girl's school? are you actually doing trafficking are you gonna kidnap the girls and sell them like or are you a christian missionary like there were all these accusations and you know as we know like everyone even the worst people they need some kind of a justification to take you uh or as i all need to justify for herself that norway is bad you know inventing all those stories so i just felt that this was getting so nasty and uh i just and then this was this big, and I was right. This neighborhood became the icy stronghold. You know, women were taken out of their cars because they were driving or because they didn't wear a scarf and they were shot on the street. And my reporting very often is going back to the same place every day for years, like the diner. I'm there, you know, day in and day out. The school, I was there. I would have been such an easy target because, you know, I came there at eight and I left at four. It's like, yeah, I, I wouldn't have survived Libya, I think, if I'd stayed, unfortunately. There's a, <laughs> <Be dramatic. laughs> a, there's a review in the New York Review of Books by Christopher de Belague, Um, And he, he um, says that, you know, the problem with your reporting is that you don't, allow, but you, you're covering things at such length, you should put yourself in the story because you have impact in the story, you're there, you need to be honest with the reader um, about, you know, how you've reported it, where you are, and where you were at that particular time. Um, I don't have a degree with Christopher, I know Christopher. Um, what's, what's your position on that? Uh, yes, I mean, um, it is, uh, that's what I'm trying to do now. And I think I'm failing massively. <laughs> it, is, um, it is difficult and I, I but, but the reason why- So this time, now, this time around, this is very much you first person, you are working the diner, this is you, your experience and your relationship with these other people around you? One part of the book, not the historic part, because obviously I was not there in the history, but but the, now these four years, yes. Um, but, uh, but I think, I mean, the reason why, starting from the bookseller of Kabul, it was actually, um, I was, I was afraid that if I'd been in that book, imagine, I come to Afghanistan and it's dirty and I'm wet and people are staring at me and I feel uncomfortable in the burqa. I take off the burqa, I wear the burqa. It's like, blah, 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 blah. It's like, yes, who cares? Wouldn't that just be, of course you can do it like brilliantly, but I think I felt that if I wasn't there, people would identify not with me, who would have been the one who had the lifestyle more close to them, 
but to to actually her name was Layla too. I I uh, the 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 um, you know the young girl who wants to have an education, even the bookseller, like see Afghanistan through their eyes. So it's like that just the in 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 incentive, uh, and. Um, I just also with one of us who, which is probably the most painful book for me that I've uh, written, there was just no place for me. It's like, I'm not in the story. Like I was not in his planning. Mm -hmm. I was not in these young kids' lives that he killed. I was like, yes, I covered the trial and I did the research, but it's like, where in the book should I be? And also with the two sisters, like they're fascinating. If I, I could have put in like, oh, how I tried to, to find them, how I, you know, my research, uh, my, but it's like, it would just have messed up the reading process, the reader. I mean, just, just to recap for those, um, I mean, the, the, the way you construct the book is you follow the lives of three young people before the, the massacre. Mm -hmm. um, you tell the account of Brevik's life, um, you know, way before it, um, way before this happens. And there's obviously builds up to an into a sort of you know culmination. What what impact? Um, I mean, how how did you feel reporting on it? And what was the relationship with the victims' families? And how did you interact with them? Uh, it was um, it was a shock to us that this could happen in Norway. He was actually he lived on my street actually. This guy, so it's like this is my neighbor. Uh, you know, totally like one of us. Uh, so, um, first I went to it with a lot of distance to him and I, I was thinking, oh, this is not about him. I'm going to write a book about the, the victims. But then of course, you know, as a book develops and the book starts thinking for itself, the most interesting part is actually him. What made him, uh, what made him inside of the Norwegian society? Like, and, and the questions, even though I'm not there, the questions about, you know, are the society to blame? Is he sold to blame? You know, is he such, you know, what he didn't grow up in a vacuum. So what kind of interactions did he have that could have caused? Was it solely the internet? Uh, was it, uh, um, you know, the, the destructive relationship to his mother. It's like all these questions that, that actually expanded uh, and into the book and, and it became more, not a biography of him, but, uh, but of him. But of course, uh, to then interview the parents who lost their children, I had to, I had to pick very solid people. And I, I was very intent, I'm not gonna interview anyone before I know that they make it into the book. So I did all my research like, you know, a step away, researching them without them knowing, uh, because I didn't want to come in the situation where I in spent weeks with a mother who lost her daughter of 14 at the island, and then say, you know, I'm sorry, but you know, there's no place for you in the book after all. So I had to, f to, to find people who I kind of felt would have the stamina to go through the whole process uh, and also to find three characters that could represent the others so it's like one turkish girl the kurdish girl and then um uh, or two sisters actually which is also interesting you have the two sisters from kurdistan who come to norway just as these sisters come to norway same age from somalia same age both doing well in school why do these two girls join the Labour Party youth mm -hmm. uh, fighting for, you know, climate change or uh, equal rights for, for men and women? And these two girls, they ended up with ISIS. What was, so it's like these two sisters, like one of them, we lost. I would say we, because all of Norway or the world, we lost her on, on the island. The, the sister survives and then you have the same with three young, typical Norwegian boys, like from small villages, fishery villages up north. Three of them go together, just one comes back. Uh, so it's like, okay, with those, that's all. Like I didn't need uh, all the 77 victims, they would represent the victims and uh, yeah. 
I'm going to ask you a cliched questions. You've written some amazing books, you know, all of them very important, I'd argue. Is there one that you think that matters most or the one that you think is some, you know, the, the biggest uh, or the, the biggest achievement for you or better than the others? Does one stand out? It's like, uh, who do you love most of your children or who do you hate? <laughs> no, but I, I mean, probably the book I mentioned now, uh, that is, that is just like the book that still has um, impact on me. Like I can it's still, it sounds a cliche, another cliche. I can still, you know, it still makes me cry. So sometimes when I talk, uh, when I speak about some of these victims and and it's also interesting like you know there's so many victims in the world like so many so many terrible terrible you know uh, why do these Norwegian kids does it actually mean that they are closer to my heart than an Afghan victim or a Syrian victim so so it's like I feel a bit um, um torn by that the most because it's the society from which you come I mean, as that's what the, the, the book is about so it's the one probably. that is closest to home isn't it yeah probably mm. and and also you know i really got to know them so well uh, after they were dead but still uh which i haven't really done uh i mean in syria the, the two sisters i write about the aggressors or how to say the the the, the thugs or the those who destroyed and killed and and, uh, and raped. I mean, the girls who follow this ideology. So it's like there I'm on the, you know, how how these two girls, how they approve of the rapes of the Yazidis uh, mm. and of the Kurds. Uh, so it's like, I find both sides interesting also to, actually it's, it's interesting to, 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 to portray uh, the the bandits and the the, the aggressors. Mm -hmm. well, Asna, thank you very much indeed. It's been a real pleasure talking to you about all of this. Asna Sirstad, thank you very much. Thank you, Nick. It's nice to see you again.